Helen McCabe, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning. Hope it was a good night. Look, it was an incredible night. Yes, it was an electric room, as I'm, I'm sure you've seen this morning. Yes, we can see. And I'm wondering, actually, when Peter Credlin was in full flight, and, and I describe her as, as defiant and from time to time angrily defiant in what she had to say, what was the feeling like in the room? What was the response of the room? Well, you could have you could have heard a pin drop, a pin drop actually. Um, and, and from my perspective, I'd spoken to her a bit about what we were going to talk about, but I still didn't really know how strong she was going to be. Um, I suspected she was probably uh, not going to say that much, and I had Annabelle Crabb all sort of primed to kind of fill in the gaps. But it, it, as it turned out, she had quite a, a lot to say, and so ever there was complete hush in the room, and there were outbreaks of applause uh, at times when she really made her most powerful points, but. The other interesting thing was there's a vulnerability about her too because she also talked about her battle with IVF. So mm. she, did the, she did the strong but the honest and the raw. Um, and so in terms of the overall performance, um, there was lots of light and shade and you know, the, the grabs just showed the strong stuff. But there was a lot of moments of vulnerability as well. Take me back um, through the, the judging process because I, I know there was some discussion by the judges about who should be number one. And, um, and Peter Credlin uh, got up and then of course history unfolded the the way it was. What was what was the nature of that of that argument about who should get the number one position? It actually, it was it was really interesting, and, and it was um, it was was quite uh, it was debated all day. And then there were a couple of judges that weren't there, so we had to go back to them because the vote was so close. Yep. But what happened was last year, and a lot of the judges were the same from last year. We uh, gave the gave it to Julie Bishop, and if you remember, Julie Bishop was really on the ascendancy at that point, and she was being talked about as a, a as a leadership contender, um, and she'd never been really previously before that so it was quite easy um, to give the the number one spot to Julie Bishop the previous year but this time round there was a sense that Peter had survived um, the, the the February kind of attempt at a coup uh, and that she was probably more powerful than than ever and that because Julie Bishop and her, I guess, hadn't had so much to do with each other. Um, they were a bit weakened in some ways. Um, and we decided as a result that by very narrow margin that probably it was Peter at that stage. Um, and you, you know who was on the, on the judging panel. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Women's Weekly that judged it. It was, a, it was quite a diverse range of judges. And, and the vote, I think, in the end was like only two votes um, ahead. Uh, but, you know, still... It was interesting to, to watch her last night. I mean, for me, it was, oh, you know, it, it's going to be a bit of a problem for the magazine and obviously we're going to get criticised because uh, putting her in the number one uh, slot when the magazine only comes out tomorrow, I think. So, uh, you know, I was expecting to be, to be criticised for it. But watching her last night, I think in many ways, uh, your viewers, for example, can see why she uh, got a vote like that and why she was regarded as the mm. most powerful woman because, you know, she's, she's quite formidable. Uh, was there, did it go through your mind at any point when she then lost her job because her boss lost his job? Did you have a moment where you thought, OK, I actually need to rethink this edition? <laughs> Uh, well, yes, of course, uh, we did, uh, but there wasn't a lot we can do. The, the, one of the problems with publishing a monthly magazine, they're quite big and they're trucked all over Australia and they're printed in uh, lots, so mm. that section was printed. Um, now, I, I caught the, the front of the magazine, so I addressed the problem in my editor's letter. Um, we did do uh, a small piece around um, Malcolm and, and Lucy, who we've covered many times in the magazine before, so we had great pictures of them. Uh, and Lucy, of course, was on the judging panels. So um, that was that was part of the interesting thing about this judging panel and the and the and the head of former head of news and current affairs at the ABC and the editor of the Australian. So, you know, yeah, we, we sort of we caught the we caught the front of the magazine, but it's not a luxury I have really um, these days to kind of pulp a magazine. But there was uh, there's always a lot of confusion uh, about um, magazines, but you can't. Th she was never on the cover as such. So yes. um, this month it's Oprah Winfrey on the cover, which is the first time we've ever got a chance to speak to Oprah Winfrey. So it was kind of funny to be sitting there with a big debate about um, Peter Credlin when Oprah Winfrey uh, is the, actually the cover and, and but anyway look it's, it's just one of those those um, things and it was unfortunate I, I have been through this before uh, with Julia Gillard and a, and a knitting story that you may remember it yes. was exactly the same timing uh, we were coming out there was a leadership coup on the way um, what do you do with it? Do you run it? Do you scale it back? Do you? Well, it, beca you know... it becomes part of history, doesn't it? So oh, I, well, I guess yeah. it, has, it, it has its place there. But I'd like to quickly, in the time we have sure. left, um, uh, if I can, Helen, run through the top ten of your 50 most powerful women. Peter Credlin, we've said at number one. Julie Bishop takes that second position. Uh, Tanya Plibersek is number three. 
And, uh, and then uh, an interesting choice for four and five, Rosie Batty, who of course we all know and is the Australian of the Year, and Jane Holton, yeah. who uh, Peter Credlin mentioned in Dispatches, and Jane Holton has been a senior bureaucrat for many years now too. Yes, and, and yes, she was there last night, and um, actually she was there to the bitter end. I think I remember popping her in a cab. Um, so it was great to have Jane Holton there. Yes, I mean, that's right. I mean, she she runs a, a massive department, a huge, I think it's something like $48 billion she's responsible for. Uh, and. Um, it, the thing about this list for, for the readers is it gives us an opportunity to highlight women like Jane Holton and, and the work they do and I hope uh, give young women uh, an opportunity to, to see uh, these women get ahead and maybe aspire to, jo to mm. jobs like Jane Holton because they are really influential roles. Now Rosie Batty, domestic violence, what she's done uh, in terms of putting domestic violence on the, on the landscape in this, in this country is unparalleled. We've, you and I, for example, have been talking about domestic violence probably for a long time particularly at women's forums and International Women's Days and Quentin Bryce has been talking about it mm -hmm. for a long time but Rosie Batty comes along and and and, and completely um, changes the debate and makes it a mainstream everyday debate yep. and hopefully we'll get some uh, get some um, uh, traction and, and some results so that's why she's number four she's changed the conversation no doubt I look forward to seeing the rest of the top 50 nice to chat with you this morning Helen thanks so much Pleasure.